Welcome to the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers and its monthly author showcase. I am your host, Peter Stockwell. Author Kevin O'Brien is visiting with us this month at the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Studios. Kevin and I met at Pacific Northwest Writers Association conference a number of years ago. A Seattle resident since 1980, Kevin writes mind-challenging and intriguing thrillers. Formerly from Chicago, where he grew up, he graduated from Marquette University with a degree in journalism. Welcome to our broadcast. Thank you, Peter. For the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. Now, writing was not your primary day job when you uh, came out, even though you had this degree in journalism. So, um, what'd you do before you made a name for yourself as a storyteller? I was a transportation inspector for the Association of American Railroads. Wow. So I had a hard hat, steel-toed shoes, safety goggles. I was climbing on top of tank cars and uh, inspecting covered hoppers and all sorts of fun stuff like that. And hazardous material cars. So it the song applies to you. I've been working on the railroad. All the, all the live long day, and then I'd write at night. Yeah. So I was, I always wanted to be a writer. So this reminded me of something Lords Kasdan, you know, the screenwriter for The Big Chill yeah. and Body yeah. Heat. He had, somebody asked him about, you know, trying to get their uh, screenplay sold. And he said, well, you know, one of the main things is to get a, a day job that you can tolerate, but you aren't going to fall back on. And I never wanted to be a railroad inspector. And it was something I just did for 17 years <laughs> and tolerated uh, while I tried to become successful as an author. And I, even after I, I published actually two books until uh, I was made enough money to quit. Uh, uh, so and then you quit. And then I got the H out of there. But, you know, I got out of there just in time for, to get my railroad retirement. So. Well, and that's always helpful. That's what yes. I did. I got out of the teaching after 32 years and I got my retirement. You know. So we, we have this money that sits there We were there just talking us. to someone about knowing when to get out. Yeah. I will not talk about who that person is. But no, we, we were won't. just talking about. But <laughs> Charlene's a nice person anyway. She is a nice person. I like her already. I've only, only met her just briefly, but it, she's a And honey for those of you who are, we are talking about the uh, soon to be retired Charlene Burnett, who works here at the uh, BCAT. Uh, studios. Your books are all standalone books, as are I understand they? it. Yes, they are. So that you don't write a series. Right. Uh, does anything in your background inspire these stories that you write? I mean, well, after all, do you have any train stuff? Uh, you know, I've always thought about doing a train thriller, but uh, I, I think I worked at it too long that I can't find the interesting angles to it. You know, I think when I first started, maybe that would have been the time to tap into that. But um, the reason I do standalones is because, except for trains, I'm never, not really an expert at anything except maybe trivia, like movies and stuff like that. But I'm, uh, I think you need a heroine or a hero who's an expert at something in order to sustain a series. Uh, so, you know, uh, the people will be very tolerant if they're, they're detective is an amateur detective. You know, it's, it's a school teacher who has to be a detective for, for uh, to solve a serial killer uh, spree that's going out there. Yeah. But um, if, if it's like a forensic specialist, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to tap into what, what that would require. So uh, I, I kind of back off and always make my um, heroes and heroines amateur detectives so that, you know, people aren't going to go, Hey, you know what? I, I know a forensic specialist, and he would never do that. You know, so yeah, that's well. That's why we buy DL's books. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's that's one reason. The other reason I don't do standalones is um, I love a good ending. You know, mm -hmm. I love to wrap it up, and and not to leave too many too many things. Not leave your readers hanging for the next book. Yeah, but yeah. But that brings out the next book. That's no, true. I don't. No, it's true. But you know, as when I go to uh, book sales, it's always, it's I always get the oh great. Whenever I tell them, you know, all oh, these are standalones. You don't have to buy them in any particular order. They're like yeah. fantastic. I'll, and then I sell them my most current one or something like that. Well, that's good. You know, when I checked out your website, uh, there was some inter interesting information on it, and mm. uh, for those of you who. We'll put his website up later. Oh, good. I do recommend that you go see his website. <laughs> well, now, you also went to a high school that's kind of famous. 
Yeah, New Trier for, East. For t several reasons. For, well, for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. But the, uh, I was always kind of agog going there because uh, uh, Anne Margaret went there. So we have the same teacher. We have the same vocal teacher, well, believe same. it or not. I've, so no, Anne Margaret. And Anne Margaret's not the only one. Oh, it was Charlton Heston, Rock Hudson, yeah. Bruce Stern. Virginia Madsen, uh, Senator Charles Percy, Ralph Bellamy, uh, God, the list goes on and on. So uh, Liz Fair, who's one of my favorite singers, um, and Scott Turow. So well, Scott there too. Scott Turow yeah. is from uh, New Trier. So it was a. I think I, I think when I was back at Thriller Fest, he did mention something about that. About yeah. Kevin O'Brien? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, not about <laughs> Kevin O'Brien. About his high school. Did he? And that. Kevin O'Brien was. Uh, <laughs> no, well, the thing I used from, uh, from in my current book, uh, we've always got to get a plug in there, is um, my new book is Hide Your Fear by Kevin O'Brien. And um, one of the subplots is uh, these high school swimmers have been abducted and they are Ooh. being forced to, um, this crazy man has an indoor pool and he's uh, sort of, sort of like fox catcher, uh, same, same sort of plot. He's, he thinks of himself as this great swimming coach, and he's making these kids compete to the death in uh, his basement pool, and he's making them swim naked. And we had yeah. to swim naked at New Trier High School for, for gymnastics, so for our gym class. I was like, it was... It was Co-ed? No, thank God. The girls got suits, the boys didn't. So the girls were not allowed in when the boys were swimming, but yeah, isn't that yeah, weird? That is weird. Yeah, a lot of people like, in fact, I've gotten a lot of letters. That's weird that the guy's making the kids swim naked. I'm like, hey, it wasn't so weird in 1974 when I had to do it, so. <laughs> I mean, no one we do write it. what we know. We write what we, we write. know. Bizarre is the pathway that we know is. You know, most authors I've met are driven to become a known entity in the literary world. You seem to be doing quite well. Do you read, but there's one thing I got. You received some really sagacious advice from our friend Terry Brooks. Ah, uh -huh. yes. What was that? Well, and this applies to any of you who are writing books. It's true. He told me, well, I published my first book in 1986. It was called Actors. It was this sweeping saga about... I called it the Thornbirds Go to Hollywood, but <laughs> like to myself. But it was it was uh, this sweeping saga with sex and uh, scandal and all this other fun stuff in it. And I, you know, as soon as it got published, I thought, oh well, you know, I can quit my railroad job. And I thought, you know, mm. I'm going to be on the cover of Seattle Weekly. I'm going to be in People Magazine. You know, it's like, uh, and Terry was one of the first authors I met, um, and. Uh, he and Judine, his wife, was wonderful, I, like kind of took me under their wing and kind of one of the first things he said was, Kevin, don't quit your day job. It, you know, wait till you have enough to live on as an author for about two years and, and then you can quit now that you, once you get a little nest egg. So I, I as much as I hated to listen to him, he was so right because I would have been, I would have been like, well, you'd have been the classic starving artist. Yes, it's a good, yeah. totally. <laughs> exactly. So Terry was very oh, wise. Oh, was in so that. helpful. And, you know, I geared that up. I, uh, I kept working for the railroads. I still had a, I had a book out there. It was, in fact, it was kind of interesting. I had a, there was some sort of convention thing for railroad people in Washington, D.C., and I was at our ho the hotel. I checked in, and there was a little kiosk in the lobby and my book was there so i was like i was like oh my god and then these guys who didn't believe that i got a book out here it's me you know uh, my picture wasn't on the back because it was the paperback but um uh, you know i was like yeah that's me yeah, so it's kind of cool but very good yeah, i was kind of right. kind of impressed a few people there how er early in life i know you got a, a degree in journalism but how early in life did you feel a need to write it's a good question i i kind of got into the writing thing in grade school um, I was I was very influenced by Alfred Hitchcock when I was a kid, and I, my oldest sister was 
tough as nails as far as I was concerned. She's 15 years older than me, so I was sort of scared of her. She was like the disciplinarian. My, my mom was sort of just like, she was the good cop. My, my oldest sister was the bad cop. And <laughs> so, uh, I sh and she was afraid to take a shower in the house if no one else was home. So somebody else had to be home for her to take a shower. And I was like, why? And it was like, because of this movie, Psycho. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> so I was dying to check out Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I loved One Step Beyond and Thriller yeah. and Alfred Hitchcock's Presents and Twilight Zone. And I, I, I was just dying to see this movie, Psycho. So I, I became sort of psycho-obsessed when I was a kid. And I didn't get to see it until I was like a 13 or 14 years old. And it blew me away, totally blew me away. And, and in the meantime, I was starting to write like uh, for grade school creative writing classes. I was writing like these stories about like serial killers and stuff. I was like in sixth grade. Oh, good. That, that, <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure your teachers yeah, just Yeah, this is the kind of thing that they'd bring in the, the school psychi yeah. psychiatrist for. But um, actually, the teacher thought it was pretty good stuff, so he put me in a special class with a couple oh, of so other. you're special. I'm special. And he put me in a special class. And um, the, the irony of that is I, I kept writing, and I was always sort of interested in creative writing. And I took a creative writing class at Marquette University in Milwaukee, where I went to college. And I had been majoring in advertising. I wanted to be an advertising man, thinking I could be like Cary Grant in North by Northwest or, 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 or Darren Stevens in Bewitched. I thought, well, that, that, they're both advertising men. Yeah. and they're, you know. um, So I, I figured that's the way I was going to go. Um, and, but on a lark, I took this creative writing class. And uh, I started writing some of my scary stories. And the teacher liked him, and I, uh, she was really, she was terrific. She was a terrific teacher. She didn't tell, tell us how to write or anything, but she would tell us how to get published. And, you know, she told us about the writer's market and things like that, which was so useful. And instead of saying, you know, you have to write like Beowulf or something, you know, like, oh, God, give me a break. Um, so she was, she was very motivating, and I, I, I felt she spent a lot of time with me. Um, it, like, for example, she... She had a party with some editors and agents, and she invited me and like three other students to come and mm -hmm. not only read our stuff, but you know, talk to these people. And, and I pulled her aside one day, and I said, you know, I just want to thank you. I don't think I'm as good a wordsmith as half these people. I don't think I used the word wordsmith then, but I said, you know, I don't think I'm as good a writer. And she said, well, you're very enthusiastic, and your stuff reminds me of my friend Robert Block. I was like, your friend Robert Block. Robert Block. Yeah. And, I said, and I said, who wrote Psycho? Yeah. And she said, you wanna she said yeah, and, and well, Marquette there. University's in Milwaukee, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Robert Block was in Wisconsin, because Ed Gein, that Psycho was based on, took yeah. place in Wisconsin. Yeah. So, so I, think it, I think I was destined to become a thriller author from, from the get-go. So you today have a compunction to satisfy your readers? Yeah. Or is it to satisfy you? Mostly reader first, yeah. but you know I think if I get the reader, if I if I can creep the reader out and creep myself out, I'm happy. You know, it's like uh, there's nothing more satisfying. I write at night, and so I'll I'll be sitting there. Scary stuff in the scary dark. Scary stuff. I, I if I can creep myself out, I'm really happy about it. I, I you know, and occasionally I'll be writing and I'll get the ding, you got mail, and I'll check it out and there's some woman in Nebraska at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, I'm, I'm locking my doors and checking <laughs> my windows. <laughs> and she's like, I hate you, but I can't put this book down. I'm like, oh. Okay. I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, score. But, you know, I've, of course, I got to act like, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. I'm actually a nice guy. Believe me. But, but, but yeah. Well, good so for you. I always th but I think of my readers. I, I, think, I think you can't get too full of yourself if you're an author. You can't think that everything you write is gold. You have to keep thinking, this isn't good enough. So you have to keep, keep chipping away at it and make sure it's... It, it's so really, some of the stuff home. we write is iron pie, right? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are not um, <laughs> geologists, that's um, fool's gold. Fool's gold. You have a book coming out next year. You mentioned it earlier. Yes. Why don't you tell us all about this project of yours? Oh, and it just you must got be working on your next project also. No, I'm trying to. Th I'm racking my brain trying to come up with a new thriller idea. Yeah, Murder so. at the studio. <laughs> 
<laughs> if I talk too long. Anyway, uh, no, my new thriller is coming out in uh, this coming summer. So it's, it's a few months away, but uh, it's called They Won't Be Hurt. So, ooh, ooh scary title. And um, it's a sort of a home invasion story. It's uh, this woman who works, at a, works and lives at a winery in uh, Leavenworth with her two kids, her husband's out of town, and two men show up at her door and take over. And they are escaped fugitives from a mass murder in Lo on Lopez Island. So we, we, but it's the last time I worked the ferry in. Oh, God, that killed me. Just the ferry Just schedule. Just get the ferry schedules? The ferry schedules, because you know you're going to get no, no, somebody no, no. who's those like... Of us, those of us who live over here on this west side of Puget Sound, <laughs> this ferry schedule is very simple. Which one are you taking? The next one. <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you, I'm sure you've come across this when you're doing your writing. If you've said it here, and I know you've got some stuff set here. Oh, yeah. yeah We've I got guess. ferries all the time. Oh, I know, but you're going to always have somebody who's like, that ferry doesn't run at that time. You know, you, the emails you get. I don't care. Oh, I, I see, yeah. I know. I shouldn't care, and I, yet I do. I, get, I, I, I got that about the, uh, the one book that has a gun on the cover. It says, you know, that's a, f um, a starter pistol. I know, I know. <laughs> I changed the gun. The guns. Oh, the I gun people. Oh, yeah. Don't, gun people, don't cross a gun person. It's no, they be just know. exactly they, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have my own publishing company, Westridge Art, and so I get to do all of the work of getting my books out there into the market. Lucky stiff. Uh, yeah, but would you explain to us how you found your agent and how your marketing goes? I had to sleep around a lot before. No, <laughs> I, my first agent, I met them. I will recommend to everybody to join a writer's group, form a writer's group, take a class, get to know other authors, because that way you can get to know agents. Some, you know, if there's enough people in a group, one of them knows an agent or at least has dealt with an agent. So uh, I met my first agent. It, at a writer's group party, and she it was somebody, it was a friend of a friend, and they invited the agent. And um, she really believed in my first book, which was Actors, which was this, like I say, this sweeping saga. And um, she, wanted, she wanted something that, it, this was the day of Jackie Collins, where it was... Oh, yeah, Jackie yeah. was big. Yeah, Jackie was big, and so this was a m book about movie stars, and she wanted sex, 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 and she's like, I want this book. So she was really pushing for it for a while, and then she kind of lost her enthusiasm halfway through. And I knew that it was going to be really difficult to find an agent. I knew it was going to be tough. So I sent her postcards. I called her. I coddled her. I sent her candy. I did everything to just stay in her good graces. Eventually, I almost did it myself, but we, we got it published together. So. Um, in fact, it, in fact, I made a goal for myself when I was in college. I said, I'm, I'm, I want to get published by the time I'm 30. Uh, you know, and How close? My 30th birthday came and went. The day after my 30th birthday, the phone rang at 6 o'clock in the morning. And it was my agent singing happy birthday to me like Marilyn did to JFK. <laughs> and happy birthday yes, yes. to and, you. And she said, your book's due <laughs> real soon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much what she did. And she said, um, you know, for your birthday, I'd like to say that you've gotten published, but you, and you have. So St. Martin's Press just bought it up. And so okay. it was really cool. Um, but, you know, even though I, that was a good agent for that book, I had to move on and find a different agent for my next book. And that wasn't easy. It was, I met my next agent through somebody who ran a bookstore in Seattle. Cinema books. I don't know if you remember. Oh, cinema some. books. Yeah, Stephanie, a a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, she recommended my next agent to me, and I was with them for a while. And um, then John Saul. Once I got to know some authors, John Saul and Ann Rule both recommended um, my current agent. Very good. So they said, you know, you, you should you should make the switch because this agent's going to get you now some more money. Are your books still coming out through St. Martin's? No, all my that was the only St. Martin's book I've had. Um, all my books since Only Son, which was the one that came out in 1996, have been with Kensington, which okay. has been a wonderful publisher. We have a great relationship. I've had the same editor ever since 1996, John Scudamino, and he is 
He's a dream. No, no, no. Now, <laughs> you're a member of the board for the Seattle Seven Writers. Yes. Uh, tell us about this organization and, and its dedication to promoting literacy and uh, school writing in schools. Right. Well, you basically just said it. It was started by uh, Garth Stein and Jenny Shortridge, who got mm -hmm. together once in a while and had what they called their wine and wine sessions. They'd have wine and there's they'd an H in the second one. There's a H in the second one. You, n you nailed it. And uh, their legions grew. They, Maria Semple joined in, Carol Casella, Erica Baumeister, um, Kit Baki, and uh, Mary Gooderson, and, um, God and they let you in. They eventually let me in. They, that's when the place went to hell. <laughs> and, you know, and actually, their numbers grew, and they, they, decided, um, they decided to do some good with their, with their numbers. And uh, so they've, they raised money for, uh, to promote literacy in schools and um, uh, writing programs. And uh, they collect books for pocket libraries mm -hmm. for homeless shelters, halfway houses, women's abuse shelters. Um, and it's just a great organization, and um, I'm proud to be part on, on the board. And uh, we, do, we do a lot of work with libraries, and um, we do a lot of work here on the Kitsap Peninsula. Very good. Um, and our numbers are, like I say, our numbers have grown. It's instead of seven, seven Seattle 7, it's uh, more like Seattle 80. And among some of the authors who are uh, in our group are uh, Tom Robbins, Terry Brooks, mm -hmm. uh, Timothy Egan, Maria, Susan Wiggs, uh, Elizabeth George, uh, Robert Dugoni, the list goes on and on. It's, it's, it's a great group to be part of. So. And, it's so, and it's so cool too, it's like you get to meet some of these really cool Yeah, that's people. what I like about writing conferences is yes. you meet some of the best known writers in the world and you find out they are just like we just are. Just like we are, yeah. And they started their careers just like we did. That first word on that first piece of paper right. or on that typewriter way back when. Yeah. And it's, and it's surprisingly, there's not a lot of uh, rivalry. In no. That, you know, there really isn't. There's some, you know, uh, you'll, see, you'll see two big famous authors get together like Garth and Eric Larson, and there's a little bit of like, there's a little bit of fun friction there, uh, but it, it's all in good jest. I mean, they're all, they're all having fun, so. Well, the big task that I have found as a publisher of my own works is marketing. Uh, it's, yeah. it's what we all have to do in order to find our readership. So my question to you is, if a book club or some organization wanted to get a hold of you to invite you to speak, how do they do it? Well, I'm a publicity whore, so I'll do, I'll do, I'm a signing slut. I will do, I will get together with anybody. If they want, I can maybe Skype with them if they're far away, okay. but all they have to do is contact me through so my you have web a website. Page. My website has an, a contact the author thing, There's okay. and it goes directly to my email. email. Yeah. So, and you do all, phones? all my books, I can, I can, I can talk on the phone to people, sure. Okay. So, but all my books have my um, uh, contact information on them. So, it's very easy. It's just, uh, and the website's pretty easy. It's just kevinobrienbooks.com. So, and that just floated above your head, by the way. Did it? Just, oh my God, yeah. there it goes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I, I love doing book clubs and... In fact, my favorite book club right now, I'm going to do a shout out to Girls Gone Wild Reading Books. Great group. One of my favorites. They've, I'm they've glad it's reading books at the end because I've heard about the other side. I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to give you the final word. Is there anything that you'd like to pass on to our BCAT audience about this craft and art of writing that we do? Um, I would say something I said a little earlier is I recommend joining a writer's group or s forming one yourself. If you're, if you're s just starting out, I think it's really good to have uh, a support system because as a writer, as you know, mm -hmm. we, we're alone a lot and you, you know, you're kind of like the Unabomber, <laughs> you're like writing in your little spot and, you know, in don't your own little world. Don't disturb me! Right, the don't door's don't shut! Exactly. Yeah. And you do, you need that camaraderie, you need some support, you need to wine and wine with people who understand what, uh, what it's like. And it's how you make your connections and, um, and it's how you get your feedback to find out if your stories are working or not, is to, you know. So I say, 
join a writer's group, and, and we'll go from there. There's safety in numbers. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you for sharing all that you do in this literary world of ours and for coming out to record this show. Oh, Peter, it was uh, my pleasure. Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers is expanding its base of knowledge of authors in Kitsap County and from nearby areas like Seattle. Uh, Claw wants to keep our audience aware of the awesome creators of art and music and written material that's available throughout the Northwest. And I would like to also thank all of you, our viewers, for tuning in to the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television and viewing this Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers production. I also wish to thank the BCAT staff on cameras and in the director's chair. Our broadcasts are scheduled for Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. on Wave Cable Channel 3 and Comcast Channel 12. Keep in touch with our Facebook and web pages to discover where you can meet local authors and artists. And one final note. For this broadcast, the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television is saying goodbye to one of its staff. Charlene Burnett is retiring at the end of this month to enjoy pursuits of her own choosing. She has led this studio for the last several years and leaves for better times. We will miss seeing you, Charlene. I do hope everyone has a pleasant evening and a productive and fascinating week. Until next Saturday, I am Peter Stockwell with Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. In conjunction with Bremerton Kitsap Access Television, good night. <laughs>